Hey everybody, this is Colin podcasting about real estate and welcome to show number 13. Today I was delighted to welcome Marcus Krigler from Beck CFO to the podcast. Marcus is an accountant and tax expert who spent years working with some of the top real estate entrepreneurs in the country and he's provided some wonderful insights into their mindsets, their habits and how we can apply them to our own lives. It was a really good show. We covered a lot of ground and I think you're going to enjoy it. Before I, I summarize it, I just want to remind people that I have a website. It is colininvestments.com. That's C-O-L-I-N investments.com. You'll find a range of videos and reports that I put there that are free to download. Um, a lot of free materials in there. I'm adding to them every week. And if you're enjoying this show, please do give it a rating or a review. It would be very much appreciated. And if you like social media, by all means, you can follow me on Facebook. I've created a new group called Colin Investments. I'm on Twitter, Colin Investment. I'm on Instagram, uh, Colin G. Murphy. You'll also find uh, these videos on YouTube if you search for Colin G. Murphy as well. Okay, so a lot of good information there for you to, to find and, and follow that isn't on these podcasts. So getting back to Marcus, Marcus Krigler. Um, we, we spoke about a lot of good things. We spoke about how he's, he's a young guy. I think he's like 30, but you, you'd think he was 60 listening to him. You'd think he's been working for 40 years. He's a very, very wise head on young shoulders. We spoke about how he entered the labor market just after the Great Recession. We spoke about the lessons he learned from how his father reacted to, to losing a job uh, that he worked in for 20 years. That was very interesting to listen to. He has a $1,000 per hour tip that anybody can apply. I think you'll be interested to hear what that is. We talk also about the importance of education before you start investing, why people should focus on growing income streams, how they can get started, why he recommends people start a side hustle, even if you've got a great job that he wants to, you know, people should start getting those entrepreneurial juices flowing, even if it's on the side, because there's a lot of benefits for that. Uh, he says that you should never own a real estate in an S corp. So listen to that if you do. We talk about how successful business owners always know their numbers and what other habits they have. We talk about the common accounting and tax mistakes he sees people making that own rental portfolios or own rental properties. And we talk about how successful people are positioning themselves for the post COVID market. So a lot of good stuff covered in this show and I think you're going to enjoy it. So let's go over now and see what Marcus has to say. Hey, Marcus, how you doing? Welcome to the show. Hey, appreciate you having me, Colin. Not at all. My, my pleasure. I've known you for a year or two now. You've, you've done a lot of great work with me and my firm. Um, so for people that don't know you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, what kind of place you, you grew up, what you've been doing? Yeah, great question. So I'm actually from Springfield, Missouri. Most of you guys probably wouldn't have heard of that. Uh, there's probably a Springfield in every state, but I'm, I'm in the Springfield in Missouri. Uh, most people probably heard of Branson before. Branson is a pretty big tourist attraction and now a big golf attraction. So you may have heard of Branson, but I'm out of Springfield, Missouri. I, I own a CPA firm uh, that specializes in real estate, uh, real estate investing, investors in particular, uh, or should I say real estate entrepreneurs um, is kind of my core focus and spend a lot of time there. So that's a little bit of a short story about me, but I can give you a longer version if you want. Yeah, go for it. So what, what, what kind of place did you, you grow up? Where did you go to college? How did you initially get interested in, in real estate? Yeah, yeah, great story. So I went to college uh, in the years of the, 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 the Great Recession. So in 2008, 2009, 2010. So I kind of got a firsthand experience at, uh, you know, kind of what was going on in the in the world and seeing that you know, there's not a lot of jobs out there and, and what jobs were available were in particular trades and accounting was one of those trades where I found that it was pretty recession proof. And, uh, you know, being, uh, in college, I actually, uh, married my wife from uh, high school. So we got married when I was in college and actually had a child while I was in college. So wow. I grew up pretty quickly, uh, and found out that, Hey, uh, you know, the, the actual normal college life wasn't for me. I got, got into college focused on, uh, getting a career and accounting was uh, one of the careers that made the most sense for me uh, for uh, reliability in that career. Mm -hmm. And so it, it gave me a lot of opportunities that I didn't actually think I would ever get. I, I kind of anticipated doing a lot of tax returns and kind of uh, moving through a career that way. And, you know, maybe eventually getting to retire with a nice 401k or something like that. And, 
and man, that that, that has uh, my thought process has changed on that significantly since uh, kind of getting out of college and seeing uh, the ins and outs and being able to work with real estate investors and seeing kind of a whole different side of investing and investing for retirement and building wealth and and that's been that's been really really cool to see and and I've gone on a journey that I, I certainly didn't think I would ever go on. Mm-hmm. So. And, and I think I had kind of parallels with that, that that my kind of thinking changed dramatically, you know, straight after college with the kinds of people I'd been hanging around and, and, and learning from. So did you, you know, did you come from a family of entrepreneurs? Did you come from a family who were interested in real estate or, or were they in those kind of steady jobs? And, and you know, you, you kind of found something different working with with companies and entrepreneurs afterwards. Yeah, it's a great question. So um, my parents were both um, uh employees. My mother, however, um, so my dad worked for a Ford dealership for 20 years. Um, unfortunately, uh, and during that time period, uh, got laid off from his job. Um, mm-hmm. So I saw that obviously not a not a fun situation. But you know, I did get to see, um, you know, kind of how he handled it. And that was a really cool thing for me to see, you know, my father in that position, you know, he didn't really have worry because he you know, was very secure in, in how he handled money. So that was a really cool lesson that I learned about how, how to handle money and, and being prepared for th- unexpected things in life. Um, now, my mother taught me a different lesson, which she was a networker. So she was a loan originator during um, my whole years growing up, 100% commission. So while she was a W-2 employee, when you're 100% commission, you might as well be an entrepreneur. So her drive, yeah. her hustle, networking, meeting people. Um, you know, I saw that and I grew up with that going to a lot of networking events. And, and so that's kind of where I would say I get kind of both sides of, of my, uh, my skill set, you know, handling money and being able to do that very well, but also uh, working with entrepreneurs and networking with them and, and getting, uh, being able to communicate with them, which is for an accountant is such a big part of the battle yeah. to be able to communicate. So that's kind of where my background with my family uh, comes from. I like college. that balance. Can, can you give us a, a, an example of how you learned from your father about managing money? Because that's something I think most of us agree that all young people could learn about more and that, you know, managing money, managing their expenses, managing their income and expenditure. That's something a lot of people don't figure out until they're much, much older. So what what kind of lessons did, did you learn about that? Or what, what did your father kind of teach you about how to manage money so that if something terrible happens, like getting laid off, you're not, you know, the worst isn't going to happen? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So um, I wouldn't say that there was, you know, a, a particular thing. So my my family is, is kind of old school that, um, mm-hmm. you know, money is is kind of a personal thing and you don't really discuss it. You don't really talk about it. But it wasn't necessarily... Uh, how much money he had in the bank, or it was his reaction to the situation. And, and, you know, again, I I was a child, I was young. um, And and seeing his reaction to it, he didn't have a reaction of nervousness. He didn't have a reaction of, you know, hey, we need to, you know, cut back, we need to sell our house, we need to, we need to do all of these things to, Mm -hmm. um, you know, keep the house afloat it was more along the lines of okay well you know it's a it's a change you know we'll i'll I'll work over the you know i'll start you know applying for some jobs over the next three four five months whatever it is and and find the job that makes the right is the right fit for us we're not you know it's no no big deal he didn't have any panic on his face and Mm -hmm. and i think that's 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 super important for uh entrepreneurs to to you know get an understanding for that because you know, if you're an entrepreneur, you're going to have hardships. There's going to be things that yeah. don't go the right way. And there's going to be times where, you know, either a deal didn't get closed or, you know, they'll, you've, you've strung a few months worth of uh, tough months together. I mean, if you've seen the last several months, maybe some of us, us are feeling that now, but mm-hmm. uh, the ability to harness that energy and not show it to your kids and, and really show that strength and authority, I think, it, it, it goes so far in those kids' eyes. And I don't, you don't know, and I didn't know it then, right? It wasn't something that I realized at that point in time that my dad sure. was showing me strength, not in just that he's, you know, 
not worried, but that he felt financially secure, that he didn't have to go out and just uh, jump on any job that would give him a, a job, uh, you know, jump mm-hmm. on any position that would give him a job, but he could you know, kind of pick and choose and, and be able to uh, get something that he actually wanted to do at the same time um, is still provide for the family and provide that strength and confidence that, hey, we're all good, right? And that's, mm-hmm. that's huge. And I, I look yep. back on that and I really remember those times of thinking, hey, I didn't, I didn't ever have to worry. And, and maybe he did worry. I'm sure he did, you know, just oh, yeah. being a father and, and now, and I would be worried, but I hope if that ever happens, that I'm able to provide the same strength that my kids don't feel that pain that I'm sure he was feeling at the time. And mm-hmm. I think that is what financial security is all about. Yeah, no, that's great. Thanks for sharing that. And, and I think that's a great balance between the kind of strong, steady father figure and the kind of entrepreneurial networking mother. That, that's a great place to, to be and observe. So talk to us then about when you were in your, your early career and you were working with a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of business people. Can you tell us about what kind of people they were, what kind of businesses they were doing and, and how you were involved in it? Yeah, it's a great question. So when I started early in my career, it was um, it was exactly what you would expect an accountant to start with. You do a little audits, you do some tax, you do some of that kind of stuff. But what I found pretty quickly, I remember going into uh, Bill Ladd. He's actually the, the managing partner of the firm that I used to be with, a great company, by the way. Um, they, I went into his office probably two months into being a job and I was scared to death, I was sweating. And I was like, <laughs> hey, can I get some business cards? Like something simple, right? Just some business cards. Could I, I'll even pay for the business cards. Will you give me some business cards? I'm like, listen, business cards are like 10 bucks. We'll get you some business cards. Don't worry about it. And uh, that, that started the business card, a piece of paper with my name on it started my career in working with entrepreneurs. And, and so I started networking, started going in with my mother to these networking events, handing out my business cards and started having conversations with entrepreneurs, not just, not real estate investors in particular. At that point mm-hmm. in time, it was anybody willing to talk to me, right? right. And you know, it's kind of, when you're an accountant and you have, um, you work in an accounting firm, people, um, they trust you a little differently uh, mm-hmm. They speak a little bit more open about finances. So, you know, I just got the ability to learn and observe what people were concerned about, what they, uh, you know, what they weren't concerned about, what their pains were, what they, what they felt like they were strong in. And I remember the first real project I had in analyzing a business, which is all I do now. Uh, mm-hmm. But the first real project I had was in analyzing a business and it was actually a business that had a, uh, a section of business here in Springfield, Missouri, and I also opened up a store in, in a city up about 200 miles away from us. And they wanted to get an analysis done of how that, that particular part of their organization was performing. And I spent, I don't know, two or three days analyzing that and came back with a report that showed them that really that business was causing the overall business to become less profitable than it was before it was just one single store and Mm -hmm. and gave them a kind of a layout of why and that was the thing that triggered me that hey accounting is different we i can make my career and go out and uh do taxes and, and help in that way and that's great and i still do a lot of that but what really matters is being able to understand financials and being able to show people what's going right and what's going wrong and help them make decisions on those financials to be more successful going forward. It's amazing that just spending a little bit of time with some numbers, how much uh, impact it can have on your business. Yeah, it, it is. And, and you opened my eyes when you came to analyze our businesses and it's, a fresh pair of eyes that that knows how to read numbers like other people might read a book you, you spot stuff very very quickly that a layman or not even even a business owner who's just in in the game just just buying and selling and hustling all the time and they don't spend any time analyzing their balance sheets and their p l's and what what you can do is, is pretty impressive that you know in terms of where where money's leaking out where, where tax savings should be made and where they're not and uh, yeah it's, it's an unusual skill set i think for an accountant to have that you can provide that kind of uh, you know, CFO type advice in addition to just filing some tax returns, which is what the majority of, of people do. And, and 
you know, it's, it's, it's fine. But if you want to have a growth mindset and you want to grow your business, your, your kind of services is, is really useful. So, yeah, I mean, so, you, you know, you, you had a pretty unique position that you created for yourself through that initial hustling and getting those business cards and meeting entrepreneurs yeah. and, and, and bringing them into your company. And so you've you spent many years analyzing businesses and strategies of some really smart people, some really good entrepreneurs. Can you you know talk to us a little bit about what what you learned from them, what what you can share with us about what you did those days? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, let me let me step back just a second and I'll, and I'll answer that question. If you mm-hmm. if you're an entrepreneur that's listening to this podcast and you're trying to figure out a way to put bottoms or put dollars to your bottom line, I can think of no better way. And you can do this simply. I can guarantee you, I can just about guarantee you, you'll make a thousand dollars an hour doing this. Spend four hours a month in your financials. That's it. Four hours a month. I guarantee you, it will give you a a thousand dollar per hour return on your time. If you will spend four hours a month, I suggest one hour every week. Okay. That's it. One hour every week. Analyzing your business, understanding your business, spending time with that business, you will get a, at least a thousand dollars an hour return on that. So that's one thing that I learned is that the ones that were the most successful knew what their financials were. Simple as that, bar none. There was, if you ask them a question, generally speaking, right, they may not know how much toilet paper in their business cost them last month, right? Mm-hmm. But if you want to know what their margins per deal was, or you want to know how much net profit they made, what their cash flow was, how much cash is in the bank, they'll answer it quickly. Right. right. One of our biggest clients that we had back at Duckett Lad, one of their biggest, uh, one of the things that they would do is they always had a position of where their tax liability was at any given point, because that mm-hmm. would tell them what their overall liquidity was in order to actually be able to reinvest the money that they wanted to reinvest back into and this particular person, um, um, large assets. So it's the biggest key, the most successful people have good data at their fingertips where they can access it and they understand the data. And that's the big thing. And why I say going back and, and spending time in those financials, mm-hmm consistently is so important because the first time you look at it, you're not going to know what you're looking at. It's, right. it's, it's, it's different, right? You, there's a balance sheet, there's a P and L there's a cash flow statement and trying to get an understanding of how they all interlink with each other and how it, it, it all plays together is something that's a skill set that you get over time. And so if you are consistent in understanding that and spend time in those financials, you'll understand that, when something happens on this, this P and L, it changes this balance sheet, which changes this over here on the cash flow, and you can kind of trace it all so that next time when you undergo a transaction, you know prior to that transaction what you should expect to see, and mm-hmm. then here's what's the most fun. Now you know what you expect to see. You go to your financials, you don't see it. Now you can start asking questions. Okay, I thought this was going to happen, but it didn't. Why didn't it happen? Did we, did we miss something? Is our cash flow not where I thought it was? And start asking those questions with your higher level team, your leadership team. Um, and, and now you can really start maximizing the profits in your business because you know what you would expect to see and what you expected didn't happen. So now we can have a discussion around that. Mm-hmm. So do, do you have any concrete examples that come to mind where a company was missing something obvious or they made some small change that had a relatively big impact on, on the direction of their business? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, well, I can tell you, I just got off the phone with one of my clients uh, prior to mm-hmm. this meeting here. And one of the things that we have really focused on is margins in their particular business. Mm-hmm. Um, because we have statistical data that tells us what their margins should be and what we'd expect them to be, and they've, they've come up short. Now, I'm really excited to note that their margins are where they're supposed to be currently, but it took us a little bit to get there. And what we found was that they're dispositioned people. So we started with the problem. The problem was our margins weren't there, okay? Okay. So that's the, that's the symptom, but that's not truly the problem. The problem was, after doing the digging, 
we went back and we found that the disposition people, when they were having their conversation, the first, com the first part of the conversation was the discount. They started with the discount. Right. So as soon as we found that, hey, we're not, we're not offering discounts anymore. The price is the price. All of a sudden margins started jumping. And so now we're up two, three, four percent in margin, which for some of you may not be a big deal. But when you're doing $20 million a year, that, that, that all goes to the bottom line. And it's by one thing, changing one thing in your business mm -hmm. that is super simple, but you wouldn't know it unless you dove in the numbers and said, okay, this is what I expect it to be, but this is what it is. Now we got to go find out what the problem is because your financials are a symptom of your problem. They're not the problem. They just report you the problems. Now you got to go back in your business and figure out where the problem stems from. Mm -hmm. And that's the exciting part. And, and, and that's why having, you know, a group of people understanding your financials, not just one, that's why, you know, just like you were talking about Colin, having somebody outside of your organization, be able to look at the financials and say, Hey, I think these should look a little different. So we need to really go back and, and, and figure out the cause of why these numbers are, are why they are. And maybe mm -hmm. it's nothing, but maybe it's something and maybe we can solve it. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Thanks for that. And, and you're right. Sometimes it can be something small. I remember with our business, we were doing you know, about 100 sales a year and we were paying you know, all of the title fees. And we just switched it so that, or no, we were paying half the title fees and the, the buyers were paying half. And we switched it so that the buyers were paying all the title fees, which were about $700. So we used to pay 350 per transaction. And we just stopped it. We just met a default was that the, the buyers were paying the 700. And that $350, you, like if you're a buyer, it's not that big a deal. You're buying a $150,000 house. You don't really notice a $350 item or it's not going to upset you. But for us, over 100 transactions, that's a $35,000 saving that could employ an entire new member of staff or that could, you know, be, be a, a nice bonus for the business owners. It makes a big difference if you're looking at the numbers that way. It's such a big deal. Uh, those little things are such a big deal. And a lot of times what you find, Colin, and maybe you found this in your business, is that you have a limiting belief on what you can actually change. That 350 bucks, you probably at one time thought, you know, hey, there's no way that that we're going to be able to sell the same amount of houses by not giving away half the title fees. But probably when you're, you, you actually did it, you pulled the trigger, nothing changed other than nothing. you, your, your margins grew. Right. And there's a lot of that limiting belief out there. Um, and I would encourage you guys, if, if you feel like those little pieces where, you know, 300 bucks here, 500 bucks here on these deals are not a big deal. And, you know, it's keeping you in business because you're, you're keeping that uh, consistency in buyers or whatever it is. It's in every single business. I would encourage you. And I, I've done the same thing. I'll tell you that story in just a second if you want. But um, go out and, and, and execute in a way where you're not allowing yourself to hamper your profits. Because a lot mm -hmm. of times that's what the issue is. It's not really anything else other than you have a limiting belief and what you can charge for what you do for people that you should be, you should be going out there and, and providing the value and getting paid, uh, getting paid for it. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, I completely agree. So let, let's talk about, and this, this goes for business owners. It goes for people in, in W2 jobs. So people earn money and you know, they try and earn more next year and try and earn more the year after that. I mean, what have you learned about success of people, how they used, their profits to create long lasting income streams. Can you talk to us a little bit about the importance of that, about using your excess income to reinvest it, to create new income streams? And, and if that's a common trait you've, you've seen with successful clients. Yeah, absolutely. So a couple of things I want to want to hit on first is a W2 employee. And I, I, I'm not somebody that wants to bash W2 employees at all, but what I want to say, if you're a W2 employee, what I, what I want you to consider at least is taking up something on the side that will get your entrepreneurial spirit going. Mm -hmm. um, there's something about being an entrepreneur, being, uh, being uh, responsible for your income more than having somebody else responsible for your income. 
And I'm not saying quit your W-2 job. I'm not saying any of that. But I think it, it expands your mindset more than anything to go out and be become an entrepreneur, even if it's selling something on Amazon or maybe it's selling a, a, a course or, you know, there's we could do a whole podcast on side incomes that you could have uh, sure. while working a W-2 job. And that might be a really interesting one someday. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah. I, I would encourage you to do that because I think that's the first step not just about the money, but opening up your mindset to the possibilities that are out there. And plus, I like tax advantages of being an entrepreneur as well. But True. building wealth, I found was very, very, is actually very simple. The theory, the theoretical part of building wealth is actually very simple. People that try to build wealth are the problem with building wealth. There's really no complication to building wealth. It is you have X amount of money, you allocate X amount of money to putting it in something that is going to make money on that money. And we can, we like real estate, but that's not the only wealth builder out there, right? There's other wealth builders out there, stock market, there's bond market, there's plenty of other things out there, but we like real estate and there's a hundred reasons why, but put that little bit of money aside and you put it into this little asset category. The cool thing about an asset, an asset should do a few things. The asset asset should be able to grow over time and the asset should produce cash. That's one thing we like about real estate is it does both. It grows mm-hmm. over time, then it produces cash. Eventually, when you do that, your pa- that little passive bucket continues to get bigger, bigger, and bigger. And that passive bucket now creates baby passive buckets, right? And so now you're creating little baby dollars that are coming through. And so the, the theory, the simplicity of building wealth is simply taking your chunk of change that you get every month, whether it's from your entrepreneur job, whether it's from your W-2 job, whatever it is, putting a little bit of that aside into an asset and getting that asset enough to where that asset is making more assets. And that, mm-hmm. that, that asset making more assets is called retirement. Retirement's not 65. Retirement is when you have enough assets that are making enough assets for you to retire off those assets that it's making. Right? That's as simple as it can be. And that can be at 30 years old. That can be at 90 years old. Right. Let's hope it's not at 90, but mm-hmm. it, can, it can be at 30 if you do it right. And of course, you got to have a pretty high income to get there. Yeah, you're right. And you know, h- how much do you need to start investing then? I mean, what would you say to people that might have you know, $10,000 saved or, or $30,000 saved? Should they wait until they get to a certain level? Or is there, you know, safe ways of, of, of just getting started investing and getting in that mindset? Is that, is that better than waiting? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. So um, let's talk about the difference between money available for investing and savings. Okay. Sure. Savings are, Hey, this is my do not touch fund. I'm not, mm-hmm. this is my, Hey, I lost my job and I don't want my kids to worry fund. Right. That's yep. what that's about. Right. That's mm-hmm. the that's the lesson that we learned from the beginning. And you need that first, right? Before you start you investing. You need that first. So I'm I'm going that's your investment in yourself. That's your investment in your sleep, right? And right. we all know sleep is important. So invest there first. Then if you can start saving up that 10,000, that 20,000 and we're using pretty big numbers for some people, but and and it's an overtime thing. Then it all depends on your asset category. You can absolutely get into something with $10,000. Um, some funds, if you like real estate, some funds will even take as low as a $5,000 investment and give you a, a, a preferred return, which is basically um, another word for interest. It's not uh, taxed as interest, but it's basically interest on your, your money. You could go as low as that. Um, but if you had $10,000, and again, I'm going to, I'm going to probably come off a little cliche here, but if I had $10,000 to invest, the first place I'm probably going to invest is knowledge to understand what to invest in. Okay. okay. That's pretty that's good advice. probably where I'm going to invest. I'm going to get an understanding of all my opportunities and you probably, you're not going to need $10,000 to do all of that. No. But what it's going to do is give you an understanding of everything that is out there, not just everything that you've learned to this point in life, because I can tell you that I learned new investment strategies and I'm in, I'm in the game. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this every single day. I do it for a living. So I'm understanding new things every single day, 
So for somebody that's in a W-2 job, or maybe they're, they're, they haven't spent a lot of time with investors, you know, they're, they're probably haven't, they probably don't understand all of the opportunities out there. And, and, and more importantly, what opportunities make them feel comfortable? Because everybody's opportunity looks a little bit different. Maybe they want to buy a house. Well, that's a good, you, you may be able to buy a house for $10,000 down and, 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 and finance the rest if you have good credit. But you may not want to own the house. Maybe you just want to lend money. So lending is another opportunity. Uh, maybe you don't want to do anything with real estate and you want to go do something in another market. Um, yeah. That may be true, but you can't get a feel for what that is until you actually start researching and knowing the truth about each and every investment strategy. No, that's a great point about education. It's, it's you know, for, for people that have an open mindset, it's a never ending process. And every now and again, I'll come across someone with a kind of closed mindset that they think they know what the options are and they don't need to learn more. And, you know, just tell them, well, you know, look at people like Roger Federer, greatest tennis player ever lived. He's got a tennis coach. You know, look yep. at the, some of the biggest entrepreneurs in the world. They've, they've got coaches to teach them how to be better CEOs and better business owners as well. Some of the best Oscar winning actors, they have coaches teaching them how to be better actors. So why wouldn't any investor or any, any person who wants to learn more about investing, why wouldn't you continue your education? And that could be listening to podcasts. It could be going to your local uh, real estate investor meetings. It could be just investing in a, in a few books. You know, it can be going on websites like biggerpockets.com and joining in the forums. And there's there's a ton of things you can do for, you know, a lot of free stuff out there. There's a lot of stuff that will cost you like tens of dollars. I'm not even talking about hundreds of dollars. It's very, very just requires your your, your time and your your energy and your, your commitment. And like you say, that's something you, you should do for just some people are just tempted to do what their educated friend is doing. They just like meet a guy for a coffee. What what are you investing in now? I'll just copy that. Like this, don't do that. That's just a lazy option. Do your own education. Do your own thinking about what's what's good for you. Don't just follow a guy who's recommending a stock or recommending a house or recommending a loan. I mean, you should invest in yourself and think and, and don't take shortcuts for that stuff. I'm, I'm sure you'd yeah. agree. I, I, absolutely right. I, I'll say there's one caveat to education, and and it, you know it's an interesting. Um, it's an interesting place to be because you can educate yourself to death. Yes. Right? So there's a, there is a, there's a fine line between, there's a lot of people out there that are highly educated in real estate, probably can sit there and hold a really good conversation with both of us and have never done a deal. And then never, I've never t taken action. So there's this fine line between education and action and education is simply that. You get a base knowledge, but you you will never truly understand that asset category that you're interested in until you actually get in and do it. And that's the key. Um, that's that's ultimately the key is getting in, taking action on it. And again, if you take action with with money that you're you are okay with losing, right? It's not it's not your last ten thousand um, dollars. Then you can you can breathe a little bit better. You can sleep a little bit better, and you have a chance of losing it. I can tell you that, but I can promise you this. If you lose money on an investment, you will learn and get that money back on your next investment. I can almost guarantee it. Um, it yeah. happened. I've seen it happen. You asked me earlier, what is some, what are some of the lessons that I've learned from some of the best entrepreneurs I know? They didn't quit when they lost money and they've all lost money at something. Absolutely. That's, they've always done it. It, it just happens. But it's about rebounding from it and getting back in the game when you can. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. And, I, and, you know, we've I've lost money myself, my business partners, David and Catherine, we've lost money on real estate many times, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars. But I would I would think we've made more than that back just from those scars, <laughs> from those <laughs> lessons learned that you just learn what to change and what to oh, absolutely. strengthen your position. And and just briefly on that point, you, that you can research yourself to death. I, I published a report that people can download on colininvestments.com. It's the four types of real estate investors and how to move on. The first one that I labeled research fanatics, you know, that they spend all their time just reading and they're super educated and super knowledgeable, but they never do any deals and they, they have information overload. They, they have, you know, real risk avoidance. They get an analysis paralysis, too much time in front of a computer and too little time networking with people and too little time out in the field. Yeah. And so, you, you know, you, you reach a certain minimum threshold and, and you continue educating yourself and then, but you also continue investing. It's, it's kind of both at once. Um, 
Okay, let's let's pivot on a bit. So let me think. Okay, so let's let's talk to let me ask you a question for the people listening that have real estate portfolios. You know, they have whatever their job might be. They they might be in real estate or or they might just have a, a a different job but they own real estate. What are some of the common mistakes you see people making on the accounting or, or tax side uh, of their real estate investments? Yeah, yeah, great question. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take them as two different questions because the, the accounting side and the tax side are a little bit different. So sure. on the accounting side, um, for holding a port- portfolio, a, a lot of people um, that own a portfolio, maybe they're turnkey buyers, uh, and, and they rely on their property management company to provide them the data, correct? And, mm-hmm. and that's what they give to their accountants. I'm actually not a proponent of that. And here's why. If you get your data from a property management company, I would still like to see that data input into a set of QuickBooks because your loans are typically ran through your own personal uh, account, right? So you've got your mm-hmm. bank account that you're, you're paying your loans out of, your escrows if you have your taxes and insurance escrowed as well. And a lot of times that's not getting accounted for in your overall cash flow. You, you're seeing your checks come in every single month, but you, what you're not seeing is the, the principal come out so the, the actual net profit or the net cash flow, we don't really talk net profit when we talk about uh, real estate portfolios because that's a fake number, but we talk about net cash flow with real estate portfolios and that gets distorted. So when you can go out and put that into QuickBooks and then you can get your loan payments into QuickBooks and then you can go out and pull reports that say, here's your you know, balance sheet, here's what, how many assets you have, here's what the debt is on those assets. Here's what your PL looks like, even though the PL is fake. I, and I would encourage you not to look at your PL for a rental portfolio because it is fake. Um, and I, we can kind of go into that. But more importantly, the cash flow on those uh, uh, port, on that portfolio and understanding how much cash you're actually making and then comparing that cash to what you've invested in the property. And that'll give you your cash on cash return, uh, mm-hmm. which, which most people are mo- the most interested in, right? Okay, I invested 100,000. I made ten thousand dollars this year in cash flow. I had a ten percent cash on cash return. That's you know we did well. Or or maybe we only made three thousand and we only had a three percent cash on cash return. Well, what's the problem with that property? Do is it? Do we need to dispose of it? You know, is there a better use for that property than just renting it out how we're doing it now? Mm-hmm. And until you can make those decisions, uh, you can't make those decisions unless you have. Uh, that in some sort of QuickBooks. And it's a very, very easy thing to set up. Um, pretty simple to do. You know, QuickBooks cost you, I don't know, 35 to 50 bucks a month. I don't know what it is. But again, it's that it's that theory that if you can spend a, an hour in your books, you're going to get $1,000 an hour to do it. So, you know, if it costs you 50 bucks and it gives you the ability to spend that hour, you're getting a good return on your investment. So don't look at the cost of the platform to prevent you from doing it. Look at the returns Mm -hmm. that you can get off of it if you utilize it the correct way. So that's the accounting side of it. Okay. The the tax side um, is different for everybody. So I've seen a lot of a lot of various mistakes, but the one I've seen um, the most common lately um, is putting your rental properties in S corps. That is the that is the biggest no no if. If somebody doesn't take anything away from this podcast, don't, if they only take one thing, no rental properties and escorts, whatever you do, please stop doing that. Uh, it is not a good situation. And, and I don't want to, we don't have the time on this podcast to go through why it's not. Um, you can certainly reach out to me and I'll send you an email on how to, and on why it's not, but it's not, it's not a good deal for you. It can cost you a lot in taxes and it can prevent you from saving a lot of money in taxes. So that's number one. The second thing is understanding when to take advantage of depreciation deductions. So for for a lot of us, and I don't know how much you've talked about your show and how much your followers understand, but uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, of 2017 really got mostly enacted in 2018, um, but some of the benefits were in 2017 as well basically Mm -hmm. said that you can take 100% bonus depreciation on uh, assets that are 15 years and less. And that's tangible property assets, not intangible assets. So 
what we do um, for investors that qualify is we go in and do what's called a cost segregation study. Now, a cost segregation study is basically going in and saying, okay, you've got a house and that house is made up of components. Some of those components can be depreciated at a faster rate than the overall house can. So mm -hmm. we go in and we take out those components and we say, hey, you can depreciate these assets faster. And because of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, we can actually depreciate 100% of that portion of the house in year one of owning the house. Well, just to put some numbers behind it, I can give you an example. So sure. on a uh, $79,000 house, I'm giving you this example, this is hot off the press because I just saw the cost segregation on it. On a $79,000 house, we were able to take in first year deduction, $17,000 in depreciation in the first year. Now that's not a book loss. And that's why we, that's why we say profits in, um, in rental portfolios don't matter. Because if you just looked at the profit, you're going to show a huge loss on that rental property because of depreciation, which is not a cash, uh, a cash loss. Yep. But on this particular deal, they, they're going to take $17,000 and because they qualify, they're going to be able to take that $17,000 against their ordinary income and offset taxes that they've made from another business, which is pretty cool. Um, yep. But the biggest mistake that I see is not understanding when and when not to use it. I've had a number of people not use cost segregation studies and depreciation when they could have and could have saved tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes. And I've seen people use cost segregation studies and not be able to use them and just paid, you know, a significant amount of money to, to get the reports done, but they weren't actually able to utilize the benefit of them. So it's very, very imperative. If you think that you are qualified or not qualified before you under, undergo it, make sure you have a good tax professional uh, give you a, uh, an analysis of whether it makes sense or not for your particular situation. Absolutely agree. Get, get a CPA to look into that for you. And not every CPA is very knowledgeable about accelerated depreciation, by the way. You need, you, sometimes you need specialist people like Marcus. And just one common sense tip, don't take a ton of depreciation uh, one year if your intention is to sell it the next year because yeah. you're, you're going to end up giving it back. So if you're, these are perfect for long-term holes, you can, you can save a ton of money on your annual taxes. And I, and I you know, I've saved you know tens of thousands of dollars on depreciation of my rentals. I know other people that have saved hundreds of thousands. I know people that earn very high six and seven figure sums, but pay very, very small taxes just because of the amount of real estate they purchase every year and the amount of accelerated depreciation they do. So it is it is a pretty big deal. And if you have a portfolio, it's something you should uh, you should look into with a specialist. Absolutely. And, you know, we talked a little bit about wealth earlier and, you know, one of the key figures that in that little simple formula that we talked about in building wealth is reducing your tax liability, right? I mean, when most people's lifetime expense, biggest expense of their lifetime is taxes. When you combine personal property tax, real estate tax, sales tax, income tax, state income tax, excise tax, I mean, you're getting taxed everywhere you go. And so that's usually most people's biggest expense over their lifetime. And if you, and you should be going through and analyzing where you can save those taxes, because ultimately when you save those taxes and you can put those into a multiplier like real estate and, and not only just save the taxes, it's money that you kept, but put it into an asset that can multiply that, those returns. Now you've really, really accelerated your wealth building strategy. And I think it's, it's imperative for people to, to analyze that and make sure that they're paying yeah. the least amount in tax as possible. And, and I, I'm glad you said that because there's a big difference between saving $50,000 in taxes and then upgrading your car with that extra money or saving yeah. $50,000 in taxes and using that to reinvest in other assets and other income streams. Obviously, the latter is what we recommend on this show. That, that's, that's exactly right. That, uh, that Land Rover is nice. It looks good in the driveway. But you might as well go hit it with a baseball bat because it continues to lose value anyway. So um, it's probably not the best investment. But it does look nice. I, I, it does I, look nice. I, I, I agree. But, you know, it can wait. 
So let, let's have your let's passive pivot. income pay for that. Have your passive income pay for that land. Now you're talking. Yeah. Yep. Have your once you're earning so much that that use a passive income to pay for your luxuries, to pay for your vacations. Now, yeah, that's that's the kind of treats you you can give yourself when you get those high enough. So, yeah, I agree. So let, let's pivot to COVID for a minute because I'm obviously I'm asking every every guest about this. I'm interested in everybody's take. I mean, you know, certainly when the pandemic caused the economy to lock down in March and, and put millions of people out of work. I don't think too many of us, certainly I didn't think that stock markets and real estate prices would be at record highs five months later. Uh, so what's what's your take on all this market and uh, or Marcus and how do you think real estate uh, is going to be affected by, by COVID in, in the short and medium term? Yeah, you know, the, you know, prediction is, is, uh, you know, it's hard to give a prediction because you're almost always going to be wrong. And if you happen to be right, mm. then you gloat about it. But I don't know that it makes any, does any good. So uh, what, I'll, what I'll tell you is kind of what I'm seeing and, and why I think we're in the market we are today. And, and I don't know if it's fictional or not. I, again, I try not to make predictions. Uh, I like facts. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why I like numbers, right? Um, so one of the things that I think the reason why the housing market and the reason why prices are still staying solid is, is just simply because we have a lack of inventory. Um, I think if we had the inventory out there that we had previously, there would have been a potential for a pretty good drop in, in prices. And, and there may be some areas, uh, the interesting thing about this, uh, this adjustment in the market is it's pretty area specific. Some areas have gotten hit harder than others. Obviously the ones with uh, more COVID restrictions ultimately have gotten hit uh, the hardest where I'm at, we haven't had a lot of COVID restrictions and, and prices are as high as they've ever been. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's a matter of supply and demand. And, you know, when you remember economics 101, you know, supply and demand really decides price. And right. because demand's high and supply's low, prices are continuing to increase. Now, the question becomes at what time does that inverse and, or does it? And, you know, right now people aren't willing to, to, move out of their properties. They kind of want to hold so that the supply is just not there. But when things clear up, will supply uh, change and will prices come back down because they've been overinflated? Um, or maybe they're not overinflated. Maybe overinflated is, is maybe that's the, you know, my favorite term right now is the new norm, right? So maybe that's the new norm. Um, sure. I don't know that I don't know the answer to that. But what I can tell you is this. Um, if you spend your time trying to predict what's going to happen next, you're going to, you're going to be wrong and you're going to fail. What you can always do to prepare for the next thing is have good financial backing. And when I say that it always comes back down to your personal finance, just like my dad, whenever he was laid off, something happened to him. It was, he was fine. He, he weathered it and we went, we went a longer way and I never felt it, never felt it once. Mm -hmm. If COVID hit you hard and you had a good financial backing, you were fine. You weathered it and you have the ability to continue because we know that real estate's always a good opportunity, right? There's all Now, there may be different ways of getting into real estate. There may be different uh, strategies that you have to do on a post-COVID environment or a during COVID environment, but there's always a way to make money in, in, in real estate. There always has been and there always will be. You got to kind of find that way and you got to adapt. Mm -hmm. But what I can tell you, if you don't have capital, if you haven't saved up for it, if, if you've spent your, your money buying that Land Rover and buying the, the Lamborghinis and doing that kind of stuff, and, and the cash isn't in the bank account right now, you probably have been sweating it. And, and not knowing the future is probably really, uh, uh, really scaring you right now. But I, I, the ones that I've talked to, the investors that I've talked to that um, feel financially stable, they are, mm -hmm. hey, I'm going to get deals done. I'm going to continue going. I'm going to do it in a safe way that's safe for my business, that I'm not giving myself too much exposure. And I'm going to adapt based on what the market tells me I need to do, but I'm not going to try and force anything. And I think that's the key. It all comes back down to good, solid financial fundamentals. And if you have those, you don't have to worry about a prediction. You just can adapt and survive and then thrive into whatever – the uh, market tells us we need to do yeah you're, you're right i think that's very solid advice and you know if just having those cash reserves maybe even increasing your reserves from what they normally are um 
you know, continuing to earn money, continuing to invest, maybe a little slower than before. I mean, like I give the analogy of some, you know, we've been in a kind of in a, a race car for the last five years with people bombing around the track. And now I think people are slowing down a bit. It's getting a little bit foggy, but you don't need to completely stop. You just need to slow down and, and you know, keep keep a bit more alert about what's going on. But certainly the people that have that strong balance sheet, those strong cash reserves, number one, they're not going to feel the pain if there's pain going to be distributed in real estate. And number two, and maybe even more importantly, if, if there are opportunities, new opportunities, they're able to take advantage of them. Because if, if prices do fall and you're stuck with an over leveraged portfolio, that's bleeding cash. You're not going to be able to take advantage of anything. But if you've got a solid financial footing, a solid portfolio that's still throwing off cash, that you've got strong reserves that you've used to make some investments and then you've held some some back for, for the following year and the following year, you're, you're going to be doing great. I mean, you don't even need to, to speculate. You, you just, like you say, you wait to see which way the wind is blowing, which way the, the river is flowing. You're, you don't need to be too far ahead of everybody else. You just need to be well prepared for whatever opportunities are, are landing at your feet. Yeah, I think I think this is the this is probably the biggest uh, opportunity to to grow wealth. Or the biggest mindset shift that you should be thinking about and growing growing wealth is if you think in decades instead of days, your 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 ability to grow wealth it it drastically changes. So you could have in the last decade. Think about this for a second. In the last mm-hmm. decade. You could have made a million dollars, lost a million dollars, made a million dollars, lost a million dollars 10 times pretty easily and still be exactly where you were 10 years ago. <laughs> what good does that do you? Right? Sure, you had some ups, <laughs> you had, but it didn't do you any good. But if, mm-hmm. if you think consistently in a decade, you know you're gonna, there's going to be times where maybe this year wasn't as good, but next year's going to be better. And this, the year after that wasn't as good. We, we tend to think as entrepreneurs that, hey, we're always going to skyrocket up. But that's not reality. That's never been reality. It's not been reality for any type of business ever. It's, businesses are cyclical. You can look at any graph of any type of business, go back to whatever you want to. The graphs are always like this. And if you think in days, you're always gonna you're always gonna struggle. But if you think in decades, and you just consistently doing the same thing, know when to pull back. Okay, that's fine. Know when to go forward. Okay, that's fine and start running right you got to yep. you got to think that way otherwise you're you're going to you're going to end up with hair like mine you're going to end up with hair like <laughs> mine yeah well you you you're doing fine and uh, so look uh, this is a really this is really enjoyable conversation i think there's a lot of words of wisdom there marcus so d- before we finish up um you mentioned quickbooks earlier i mean can you recommend any other tools that that have made your working life easier or made your working life a little bit more organized that, that you can uh, share with us? Yeah. So I'm a big, I'm a big fan of QuickBooks online for most businesses. I won't say every business, but I'd say most businesses, I'm a big fan of QuickBooks online. Um, you know, the automation, the simplification of it, I, you know, I, I, I think a lot of it, it used to be a situation where that, that tool was not as, as helpful. Um, mm-hmm. But now I'd say it has, probably surpassed and is probably the best accounting tool um, on the on the planet for most businesses. Um, Mm -hmm. Most small businesses can use it and it's fairly affordable. Um, You know, depending on what you're doing, the reason the other reason why I really like QuickBooks is because there are QuickBooks online specifically because there's a lot of uh, applications depending on your business that you can uh, utilize with it. So if you have a lot of employees, you can go out and, and get a tool like uh, T sheets is an example, which, you know, your employees can go in, put their time cards in, and that automatically imports into your QuickBooks and, and, and helps with timekeeping. Uh, there's project mm-hmm. management softwares, there's uh, construction management software there. So there's so many different things that you can basically start with a core accounting uh, model. And then get these different apps and tools that customize to your business and can ultimately help you become very, very efficient. And I can tell you um, the, the years of, for most businesses right now, if you're a small business, that's probably less than 10 million or maybe even 20 million, the days of having a full-time bookkeeper are probably unnecessary. And, and that's because of all of the automated features that come with these accounting softwares now that there's so much automation you don't you don't need 
uh, an internal bookkeeper. A lot of times you, you can get away with an external bookkeeper or a part-time bookkeeper that can right. uh, solve your problem. So, uh, you know, that, that's probably what I would start with and use all the way up until you're probably a, a 30 to $50 million business. And then there, there probably becomes some uh, heavier accounting software that you'd want to look at. Okay. All right. No, I will uh, definitely put some links to, to that on the show notes. How about books, Marcus? Are you, are you a big reader? Any interesting books that you've, you've read recently? You know, a lot of people are doing a bit more reading now than you used to with, with you know, no more, no more commuting and, and being at home a little bit more often. Yeah. So I'm a, I'm not a very good, uh, uh, oh, um, I don't remember book names very well, but um, I did just just finish the book of the owner, or I guess the CEO of Disney. Uh, and again, I'm Bob uh, Iger. Yes, yeah, there you go. His, I think his I read that one. Bro, incredible book. Um, really makes he has ten core principles in there that I would encourage. If you just, if you're not a reader, I think the ten core principles are in the first like two or three pages. Just go get those ten core principles. They're phenomenal in running a business. Um, I'm currently reading Simon Sinek's new book, which is, um, again, I can't remember the name of it, uh, but his his whole, it's The Infinite Game is the okay. name of that book. And uh, it's, a, it's a great book. It talks about, um, you know, businesses that play the infinite game versus the finite game. Basically, if you're, you're always, if you're always playing to an end, business doesn't have an end business always carries on. So there's no end. And that's why a lot of businesses struggle is because they get 10 in that or maybe it's, Hey, I mean, we want to hit $10 million in sales. Well, they got there. And then the next year they drop because they hit right. that. They won't, right. They, they, they're still accomplished. But the reality is you wake up the next day and there's still business to be done and there's still opportunities out there. And that short term thinking really can uh, hurt a lot of businesses. So that's a really good one that I'm reading right now. Um, I'd say that's probably the two I'm, I'm focused on. Awesome. And I, I like that you said that those 10 principles are at the start of the book. You know, on Amazon, you can sometimes take a preview, a sneak preview of the first 10 pages. <laughs> Maybe yep. you can just yeah. log on and, and look at that and print it out for yourself. You don't want to buy Absolutely. the whole book, but it is it is a good book, though. I, I did read it at four or five months ago, and he is, he is an interesting character. So, OK, well, look, this has been an awesome conversation, Marcus. Can you how can our listeners find out more about you and your company if they want to reach out. Yeah, absolutely. So you can get on to uh, Beck CFO, B E C C F O.com. Um, mm-hmm. It's uh, pretty simple. You guys, uh, I don't know when you're listening to this. Uh, so you may be listening to this three years down the road and that website looks a little bit better, but right now I made the website myself. So don't, so bear with me a little bit, but uh um, you can get on there and it gives you the ability to, to kind of apply to work with me. I don't work with everybody. I work with just kind of a select few group of people. Um, so it's kind of based on if I think you're a good fit and you think I'm a good fit and I can actually add a significant amount of value to you. That's kind of how, um, you know, how we're able to work together. Um, otherwise, if you have questions, I always love getting questions because it always gives me the opportunity to figure out what I'm not answering. And so okay. if you ever have a question, um, Marcus at BECCFO.com. Pretty simple. Marcus at BECCFO.com. Um, you know, usually give me 24 to 48 hours and I'll, I'll try and respond back to your uh, question. If you have a tax question or something like that, uh, obviously I can't be specific. I can't give tax advice uh, unless you're a client, but I can uh, give you some, some guidance and on how to move the right way. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the best way to get hold of me. Awesome. Well, I will put those links to Beck CFO and Marcus at BeckCFO.com on, on the show notes. Uh, thanks again, Marcus. I'll, I look forward to hooking up again soon. Appreciate your insights. Hey, I appreciate you, Colin. We'll talk soon. There you go, folks. That was show 13 with Marcus Krigler from Beck CFO. You'll find a lot of those links on our show notes for Marcus's email, his company, the books he recommends, the software he recommended. So check those out. Good guest. And I'm, I mean, I don't really have a whole lot more to add. I thought he had a lot of wisdom there. Like I said at the start, he's he's a young head on old shoulders. Uh, I really enjoy talking to him. Marcus has made a huge difference to to me personally and, and, and my accounting knowledge and, and, and how I pay my taxes. So he's, he's a really smart guy, really knows his stuff. And he's, he's got a great network of, of real estate entrepreneurs. And 
he's I think he's going to go far and I'm, I'm glad we, we got him on the show and I think you should reach out to him if, if you think he can help you in, in your real estate journey so thanks as always for listening guys if uh, you are enjoying these shows please do give me a, a rating or a review or, or share a link with your friends if you think they might enjoy listening do pay a visit to the website colininvestments.com and, and drop your, your, your name and email address on one of the forms if, if you want to keep in touch with me because I do email people regularly that anybody that downloads one of the reports I have on the website or anybody that just fills in the get in touch box I do add you to an exclusive list uh, where you do get emails maybe twice a month letting you know what I'm up to and, and, and some links that I like to share so get in touch with me that way if you like uh, as you know I'm on social media uh, you know Colin Investments with Facebook and Twitter Colin G Murphy on Instagram and YouTube so lots of ways of staying in touch with me you can also reach out to me via the website if you want to schedule a quick call just to have a chat about what's going on in your uh, investing life if you've anything you want to ask me about you know real estate tips business tips I, I do set aside some 20 minute slots for that you, you'll find those details on the website other than that that's that's all for me today hope you enjoyed this show and I will be back soon with more. This is Colin G. Murphy signing out. You guys take care. Bye-bye.